I'm very pleased to now introduce to you Professor Anand Pandian, uh, who is the winner of the Infosys Prize in the Social Sciences and from the Department of Anthropology at the Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. So when we called Professor Pandian to congratulate him, one of the things that struck me that he said was anthropology and writing is, is a little lonely and private in essence, and yet he is a storyteller. He connects to people and, so, and you know, spreads that experience that he extracts from them across. So let's tap into that collective experience and hear a little more about what he has to say about his work. So thank you so much, Bhavna, for that kind introduction. Thank you to all of you for being here this evening to share in this conversation, most especially to the Infosys uh, Science Foundation for the chance to take part in this process of collective inquiry and for your support of my work. Uh, so this is an interesting event, and this is an interesting gathering, I think, of folks who uh, get at problems from very different uh, standpoints, and there are, listening to the previous two presentations, I think there are interesting resonances between what we've been talking about until now and what I've been thinking about myself with my own work. The one thing I might say or even ask in the form of a question would have to do with forms of learning and uh, forms of thinking that human beings enter into in the absence of categorical certainty. And in fact, this whole question about dogs is actually quite helpful in that regard because it is in fact the case that there's a tremendous amount of thinking and learning that happens even when the categories that we have to work with are actually inadequate to that task and we find that the situations that we're faced with confound the capacity of our categorical reasoning to really confront that complexity. And what I want to speak about for the next few minutes with regard to what I want to call the open mind has to do with that, has to do with how we might conceive of thinking and learning in the absence of categorical certainty. And as Bhavna suggested, I'm going to do it by sharing a few stories from the work that I've been doing over the years in Tamil Nadu. Now, this has been a bit of a journey for me, and to be honest, it wasn't really until I got this call completely by surprise a few weeks ago that I really had to take stock and try to make sense even for myself as to what this route might be that I've followed. Uh, Mr. Yatish of the Infosys Science Foundation was generous enough to find a way of putting these different projects that I've been working on together in this image. I found it quite profound. There's still so much going on here? What could possibly bring this together? Uh, wh what is the route? What is the journey that takes us through books, projects like these that I've been working on? Uh, the confusion, in fact, is not simply one of my own. It is one that arises sometimes when I teach. I taught a class, an introduction to anthropology last fall. It was a very big class, 80 students. We got to have class outside one day. There's an image uh, of that particular session. At the end of that semester, we get comments from the students, uh, as we do every semester, and one of them wrote the following, which I actually thought was both really humorous and insightful. The readings are strange at first, but can be very insightful if one keeps an open mind. Anthropology, it's really weird, uh, but if you keep an open mind, uh, you might get something out of it. This is a kind of theme that comes up again and again when our students encounter anthropological work, and it, again, I think, invites us to think through this question of what it means to have an open mind. What do we mean by this idea of an open mind? What does it mean to have one, how do you get one, how do you cultivate or nurture that capacity, whether we're thinking of machine learning or the forms of learning that make the algorithms that make machine learning possible, the question of that openness is certainly uh, a crucial problem that we have to wrestle with. And I think it is one that has run through all of my work over the last few years and will continue to do so. Another point I might make, though, by way of introduction is simply to say that we have certain stories around this notion of the open mind. There are also stories that we tell ourselves about history, about the trajectory of events in the world that we find ourselves in. And we often encounter 
the idea that modernity is a kind of opening up, that as we become modern, as our society advances, as uh, history carries us inexorably forward, our minds necessarily open up in relation to those possibilities that we find, these new possibilities that we find ourselves faced with. And yet, of course, all the same, we know that this isn't simply the case. We know that the march of history also brings new closures of an unexpected kind. And in fact, one might make the argument that we are faced with uh, forms of profound closure now uh, of a kind that we couldn't have even anticipated. I am in the United States, and so this whole question of walls has become so salient in contemporary America, and the, the desire to sort of frame the country in terms of master categories that have to do with who belongs and who doesn't belong, and the great difficulty that so many people have with the very question of uh, with the very presence of those who don't seem to have the right by category to be in a country like the United States. So one, it is not obvious that modernity simply brings with, up, with, uh, bring, brings with it the kind of openness that we associate with an open mind. And two, there are, again, these questions as to what resources we might rely on if we really do want to find a more expansive way of living with instances of profound and, in fact, necessary category confusion that come with complex social phenomena like immigration, refugee resettlement, displacement, migration, all of these things confound the categories that we tend to take for granted and demand of us more open minds with regard to social belonging. How do we get there? Well, the contention I want to make is that fields like anthropology actually have a great deal to contribute with regard to problems like that because what they allow us to absorb are resources with which people have conceived of even the mind and its nature in profoundly different ways. So this is an older gentleman that I got to know very well in field work that I did in rural India in a small village called Kulapagaundanpati over several years in the early 2000s. And we were having a conversation one day sitting on a stoop. Uh, he, was, he was blind by that time and he said to me, that is to say, Thoughts ripen in the heart or mind. Uh, what, what, what happens in the heart or mind is that this is where thoughts ripen. And this, this analogy really struck me as so unusual. What does it mean to say that thoughts ripen in the mind? What does it mean to draw this analogy between what it is that happens in the world in this agrarian landscape and what it is that happens within us with regard to our hearts and minds? And of course, we also know that in India, so many people even confound that basic distinction between the heart and the mind. We We've probably all had the experience of encountering someone who might say the word mind really casually and yet gesture here. Have we, have we had this experience, right? Uh, where someone is speaking of the mind and using that English word mind and yet pointing right here. So people have a much more complex sense of what we mean by heart, what we mean by mind, and what we mean by the capacity to nurture its qualities, to develop its tendencies, to open up its capacities. And these are some of the themes that I've entered into as an anthropologist. I also want to emphasize that anthropology as a field depends on that very capacity. One can't do anthropology without an open mind precisely because what anthropology asks us to do is to enter into situations that are unfamiliar to us, enter into situations in which we're not really aware of the basic coordinates of what it is that we encounter, and yet find a way of making sense of that world, drawing from that world, and making it make sense somehow to other people who are themselves unfamiliar. This is the subject of a recent book on problems of method in anthropology that I published last year, in which I make the following observation about anthropology think through things as they erupt and evolve, wagering that they will land you in the midst of novel ideas, attune yourself to the travails of others with the faith that such exposure will bring new lessons, give yourself over to the circumstances of some other life, hoping to find yourself taken beyond the limits of your own. These methods are essential to anthropology's pursuit of humanity as a field of transformative possibility. What I'm trying to suggest here is that in a field like mine lies an archive of methods by means of which we learn to satisfy ourselves with the inadequacy of our knowing and to find a way of making our way in the world nonetheless and conveying something of value even in the absence of uh, adequate certainty 
adequate understanding. And thinking through that particular idea and carrying it through some of the work that I've been doing over the years, I've picked up, one might say, a few ideas that I want to share now about this notion of the open mind and how we might approach it uh, from a larger standpoint. The first of these ideas that I want to draw out comes from a book that I had the chance to work on with my own grandfather. Uh, it was published a few years ago. It's called Ayaz Accounts, A Ledger of Hope in Modern India. And the story, uh, the, the book follows the story of my grandfather who died a few years ago at the age of 95, following his near century of life as a way of trying to make sense of modern India. Can we take something so small as an individual life as a prism for something as large and complex as, 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 as as India, I try to make the case that we can, precisely because what we find even with a single life is a confrontation uh, with so much uncertainty, so much history, so th th uh, such a scale of what might happen to a single person that if we follow the threads of those stories, we find ourselves in the midst of much larger events at a much larger scale. And we find someone in the midst of these stories who's wrestling, in fact, with the press of events as, uh, as they catch him up in his case. So this is just one of those stories uh, from one of the chapters late in the book where my grandfather's recollecting on, his, uh, on, on a moment uh, that, uh, that he recalled as a child in which he says the following, I would go off to pluck kodukapali fruit. There were thorns on those trees, but without paying any attention to those thorns and with nothing at all on my feet, I'd climb up quickly to the top of those trees. There was a well bef below one of those trees, maybe 30 or 40 feet deep. The tree itself was 30 feet tall. It was frightening to look down from up there that far above the ground. Once, when I looked up from the top of one of those trees, I saw an airplane pass by. This was while the British still ruled India. What is this, I asked myself. Look at how it flies. It looks like a bird, a vulture. The vulture has wings, and so it flies. Can we also fly like that? Here's someone as a child confronting something whose form looks vaguely familiar and yet whose nature is unknown to him, right? and, but meets that in a spirit of wonder, in a spirit of surprise, and in a way that reminds us that this capacity to meet what we don't know, what we don't understand with an openness, with a receptivity, is something that we all possess at some level. It's something that many children that all children perhaps possess. It's something that many of us also carry into, carry forward in our lives in, in various ways. And so one, th the first principle I suppose I want to lay out for you is this idea of the open mind as a kind of natural capacity that we might uh, take for granted as part of the toolkit that we can work with as human beings. The second idea that I want to put forward, however, is that one can work with that natural capacity in more directed ways by attuning oneself more deliberately to that openness, to that dimension of the unforeseen that we encounter when we work in the world. So this is from another book that I've worked on called Real World, which is based on field work that I did with filmmakers in the Tamil film industry in Chennai and other places. Uh, this is the cameraman Nirav Shah, who's actually on the cover of this book. And this is a, a passage from the book in which he's reflecting on his work as a cinematographer, in which he says the following, I am not a magician. I am the medium. The magic is all there. I'm not creating anything with my limited knowledge and my limited sense. I'm trying to capture whatever is there. I didn't create the blue sky. I didn't create the green of the grass. I didn't create the clouds and all that. It's just how you look at it. If you look at it wide-eyed, it seems magical. If you're in a fuck-all mood, it looks trashy. You can crib about it. You can say, oh, the light is crappy. You can say the light is beautiful. On a 16-hour day, I can't say, let's wait for the right light. I don't know if it's going to happen. The idea is to be open and receptive and alert about what's around me. Happy accidents are happening all the time. So if you're open to it, you will capture it. If you're not, then you won't. What Nidav's words here remind us of is that this natural capacity that we might identify with the open mind is also something that can be worked with more deliberately. It can serve as a way of attuning oneself to those happy accidents that he speaks of here, of, of, uh, of, of actually courting those accidents and finding in them the very substance of a creative work like that of a cameraman or filmmaking more generally. The third point I want to make, however, is that this work also requires not only a certain kind of attunement to the world, but also a certain kind of relation to oneself, a reflexive relation to oneself. That is to say, we might think of the open mind as a cultivated capacity, 
cultivated capacity. That is a way, a way of working on one's own dispositions, a way of working on one's own nature to open up that capacity even further. This is a passage from the first book that I wrote called Crooked Stocks, Cultivating Virtue in South India, based on fieldwork in rural Tamil Nadu, working with farmers, uh, irrigators, agricultural laborers, trying to make sense of their notions of a moral life, in which I found time and again that the people that I encountered made sense of what it meant to be a good human being in relation to that agrarian environment in which they lived and worked, and had all of these ways of conceiving of what it meant not only to be a good person, but to become a better person in relation to the material and metaphorical resources of that world in which they live. Here's just one example. I'd spent a morning with uh, this one young man, Madhavan, helping him irrigate this bed of cabbage plants in a field close to this village. And at a certain point, the topic of our conversation shifted from the irrigation of those plants to the irrigation, so to speak, of the mind or the heart. That is to say, he turned in his own discourse to begin to speak of the, what he called the spade of wisdom, arivayendra manvati is the phrase in Tamil. That is to say, the idea that all of us have a kind of inner spade with which we turn the water of our own desires. Uh, one must take that spade of wisdom to cut off and to turn, he told me. Cut off what? I asked. One must cut off the heart, he said. Suppose we're going down a bad path. We must turn the heart, bring it around again. In the heart, there's the desire to bathe. Can we just go and fall in the river? The water may look beautiful, but there are whirlpools hidden there. That is to say, can one begin to imagine the inner space of our own desires, our own dispositions, our own inner nature as a space that can be cultivated, developed, tilled in the same way that one might work on the landscape in which one lived. This is just one of many ways in which ordinary people in, uh, in India, in rural Tamil Nadu in particular, uh, think between the spaces in which they work and the inner spaces of their own private individual subjectivities in ways that remind us that we can actually work on our moral capacities, we can work on our inner natures if we're interested in the value of something like an open mind, there are techniques that we might mobilize to, to, to further its capacities. Now, one of the final points that I want to make here is that part of the importance for me in this notion of the open mind is that it is I think a really important way to begin to think about the relationship between ourselves as human beings and the environments in which we live, work, strive, and struggle. And that we have in our literary, moral, ethical, cultural traditions resources with which to conceive of that relationship in more open and dynamic terms that I would argue also have ecological or environmental value. So to give one small example of that, this is another elderly person that I work quite closely with for that first project. Her name was Karpayama. She died a few years ago uh, herself. But uh, there are many things that I learned from her. And one of the things that we often talked about was a particular genre of poetic production in, uh, in Tamil Nadu called uh, Oppari or Oppu. That is to say funer funerary elegies that women sing when someone passes away. And one of the most profound lessons in absorbing these particular elegies from her and from others in this village and in the region more generally had to do with the poetics, the poetic structure of these utterances and the way, again, they confound categorical distinctions between self and other between oneself and the world, indeed between oneself and oneself as a suffering subject and the suffering of others in the larger world. So here's one very good example of that. In Tamil, Malige Samba One Madeorum Natavachain Madeeri Payamal Nan Madeorum Saviane, that is to say, a single stalk of jasmine rice I planted beside the river dam, the water did not top the dam, I withered beside the dam. A single stem of kartige paddy I, pl I planted beside the riverbank. The water did not top the bank. I withered beside the bank. The key point to make here is that in each of these 
poems, each of these verses, there's a shift of perspective. The person who is doing the planting, or the subject, say, begins as the person doing the planting and winds up being the thing planted, right? The person, you understand what I'm saying, right? We begin uh, by imagining ourselves as the person doing the planting and end up imagining ourselves as the thing being planted. That feeling of suffering is a kind of movement of sympathy that closes the gap between self and other, and ultimately between the self and a larger natural world of experience. And I would make the case that movements like that have profound value. We are in a time of profound impasse with regard to environment, with regard to ecology, in fact, with regard to the categorical distinctions that we rely on, that we use to distinguish our lives as human beings from those other lives that we share the world with that we don't necessarily always have as much time and respect for. And finding our way back to more respectful, generative, mutually affirming, sympathetic relationships with those wider ecologies of life and experience, nature, what have you, in the world, I think is one of the grave moral and ethical challenges of our time. And the contention I would make is that archives of experience of the kind that I've been sharing with you, poetics of this kind, moral and philosophical traditions of this kind, and indeed ways of working with the mind and its openness in a manner that opens ourselves to these larger ecologies of interrelatedness, I think have a lot to promise us in terms of wrestling with some of these impasses. I'm closing here with an image of the stream that I live near, the Stony Run, a small stream that runs through the city of Baltimore. And I spend, <laughs> when I spend time beside this, this stream, I can't help but think about these lessons that I've absorbed beside water courses here in India with folks like, like those that I've been sharing with you. And to me, the value of wrestling with stories and experiences of this kind has to do with their capacity to carry from place to place and in carrying from place to place to carry lessons of this kind with us, along with us, as we move through this world and try to wrestle with how to live in it in a slightly less destructive, more, uh, uh, more what, more vital manner. So this is some of what I'm wrestling with. It is very much a work in progress. It is very much an ongoing journey, but this is just sort of where I am at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pandian. So we do seem to be at an impasse with ecology and with, well, we need more empathy in the room and definitely an open mind for, um, but I think we have more questions. So let me hand over the mic. Thank you for such a, uh, heartwarming and uh, talk that shows that you have so much faith in humanity. Uh, the people you've studied are mostly uh, very unspoiled, pure people. Have you been able to get across to some of the people in power in our country and in the United States? And how will you get to them? <laughs> <laughs> you have a message. <laughs> I'm, uh, so I haven't been to India in a few years. And the reason is that with the election that took place in the United States in the fall of 2016, I realized that I hadn't actually spent enough time wrestling with some of these impasses in the very country that I'd been raised in, the United States. And I've been trying to write a book for a broader American public, in some ways digesting the lessons of what I've absorbed over many years here in India, trying to think against these walls, trying to think against these boundaries that have become so salient in the politics of that country. So it is definitely on my mind, but I think that part of what, part of the challenge here is, is, is for all of us to try to unseat some of these distinctions that we also take for granted. So just to slightly, um, to tweak what you what you'd said just slightly, the, the community that I worked with for my first book was a community that was classified as criminal by nature in colonial India. They were a criminal tribe. Uh, there was no community in southern Tamil Nadu more profoundly affected by the machinations of colonial governance than that particular community. And yet, these other resources remain that transform their experience of this modern time. And part of the task there is to recuperate that. Filmmakers, 
who I worked on, or who I worked with for my second book, definitely part of a very different kind of milieu, and that there was, and yet there was something in the artisanal quality of their work that brought me right back to these rural cultivators. So part of the challenge here, I think, is to resist the temptation to put some people in one place and others in another, and to really allow the force of the stories to carry between those categorical divides. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you almost, your talk was almost a combination of spirituality, the environment, anthropology, history, sociology, and so it had these in incredible confluence of different fields. And then I thought, I wonder if the kind of work and the research and your way of looking at the world would have been possible for you to do. I think it, 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 it's almost like because and maybe I'm taking a huge, make a big statement here, but because of your Indian roots, ancestral roots, but you're having been born and brought up in the United States, you are almost able to look at India That's right. with a little bit of an outsider slash insider view that is not possible or very, very, very difficult for somebody who's born and brought up and grew up here because you have a different uh, way of looking at the world. You know, I remember when uh, Kung Fu Panda was released, China was really upset because they felt it was a chi story about China and Chinese, right. but why on earth couldn't chi any Chinese creative filmmaker produce Kung Fu Panda? Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely so, question. Thank you. One of the, the basic uh, uh, sort of uh, catchphrases when it comes to anthropology and making sense of anthropology in, in, as a field is that what we try to do is to make the strange familiar and the familiar strange. That is to say, we try to bring some familiarity to what appears to be impossibly strange, impossible to understand, and reciprocally, to try to take what is close at hand and to make it seem strange so that you don't take it for granted anymore. And it is certainly the case that those of us like myself who are caught in between milieus almost ha have to do this uh, as an existential predicament precisely because we're betwixt and between. And I think one of the great challenges of our time, in fact, has to do not only with what to do with those beings that are caught between, people stranded at borders, animals that have no place to go because they've lost their habitat. There's so much that turns these days, I would say, on beings out of place, but I, th I think we can't really wrestle with the existential challenge of, the existential necessity of meeting that challenge without putting ourselves in that place, without actually allowing ourselves to imagine what it might be to be displaced in that fashion, to imagine ourselves lacking the security with which, the security that we might take for granted wherever we stand. And so, a lot of what we do as anthropologists is to sort of dislodge. Someone is, is, is reading a book very comfortably, wherever they are, in a library, uh, in bed, or on, on a sofa. Uh, can, you, can you convey that story in a gripping enough manner that the person actually feels that they're somewhere else? That sense of displacement, I think, is quite powerful, and it promises a lot with regard to the challenges that you've described. This quality of being open that you talked about, uh, in your studies, what have you seen that it correlates well with in terms of other variables like culture or education or wealth, or just the time period that you live in and so on? Because yeah. you talked about like some pretty pure people that she talked about actually yeah. being very open. Have you yeah. seen any correlations with, with you know, being open? I, I definitely do think it's the case that we have cultural, literary, moral traditions that we have access to in India that are less caught up in categorical distinctions that one might make the case organize a lot of life in the modern West. That is to say, I think that there are resources that one can draw on that don't require us to begin with a categorical distinction between this and that, or this and not this. And there's plenty of evidence of that kind, and that's part of what I've tried to work with in various writings. 
However, having said that, how we make sense of those resources, in whose lives do they become important, and how there's a tremendous amount of variance there. And people may live side by side in the same place and yet have profoundly different ways of living in the world. And there is that openness, in fact, uh, to how it is that people make use of what they have available to them. And so in a very modest way, all I see myself doing is calling a little attention to different forms of moral and narrative resource that could stand to be amplified a bit with the hope that people might see some value in them. Um, um, you know, it, it's clearly a salutary methodological instruction to keep an open mind in anthropological inquiry, but I'm just wondering if there are uh, even in anthropology, times when one wants to actually put a constraint in the opposite direction. Yes. So, so if you take criminal law, for instance, it's a very interesting thing that in many countries, the United States, where you're domiciled, for instance, um, juries don't get the instruction, keep an open mind. Hmm. They get the instruction, innocent until proven hmm. guilty. Right. Right. And uh, and they are told that you know you actually have to to assume or presume innocence, which is very different from keeping an open mind. Because if I'm told to presume innocence, then if a witness tells me I I saw the man coming in through the bathroom window, I might be skeptical, right? If I'm presuming innocence, mm. so but you are told to presume innocence. You're not told to keep an open mind. So it's not neutral. You, yeah. you, so why is that in criminal law? Well, obviously, because there are cognitive prejudices. You, you feel if somebody's been accused of something, there must be something to it. You know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Right? So in, in order to counter cognitive prejudices, you are told to have this, not an open mind, but in fact. The, and given how much as anthropology, anthropological inquirers, we go into the field with prejudices, I wonder if one shouldn't sometimes put a constraint. And so you may want to explore something, you know, that is a, uh, different from an open mind too. It's just a thought. I hear you. I hear you. And I think you're absolutely right. I think you su suggested it lightly at the end that we don't necessarily find as much of it as we'd like to see when it comes to the scholarship that we encounter. And I, should, I, I suppose what I should say is that I fell into anthropology myself completely by accident. And I fell into anthropology by accident because I had been an environmental activist for some years, quite concerned uh, in my teens and early 20s. And troubled by the presumptions about human nature, about what makes people tick, about why people do the things they do, that I found in a lot of these debates and discourses, it, they, they seemed insufficient to the complexity of what actually seemed to be happening. And I turned anthropology as a way of excavating some of that complexity, as a way of restoring some scope of possibility to what would otherwise appear to be a rather dark picture of the future that lies ahead. I say this simply to say that this is an intentional inquiry. This is an inquiry, uh, in fact, quite explicitly motivated by the sense that a kind of uh, categorical overdrive has much to do with the problems that we find ourselves faced with. and that the work that I've been doing is sort of deliberately pitched in corrective terms in the face of that kind of momentum. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pandey.